Let's give a warm welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, uh, an honor to be here, and um, thank you, Michelle, for um, bringing me up to Fairbanks. And I guess since we are pressed for time, I've got until about 8.20, so I have uh, 20 minutes for question and answers. So tonight I am going to talk a little bit about um, saving and healing lives through organ donation. Um, the title there is HDPM, and that just means Hospital Development Program Manager. In other words, I'm the liaison between the organ procurement organization and all of the hospitals up here in Alaska. So I'm, I'm kind of the, the boots on the ground. There are four of us here up in Alaska and soon to be a fifth person. Um, and so I do really the, the groundwork, the follow-up with the hospitals, and then our other four employees are the nurses or organ recovery coordinators. So tonight... I'm going to talk a little bit about who we are, what kind of regulations we as the organ procurement organization has to comply with, um, donor designation, what is that anyway, ethical considerations because there's always ethical considerations in the medical field and questions always rise uh, when we're dealing with organ donation. Um, why donation? Why are we even doing what we do? And then the different the types of donation that uh, we do work with. So before we start anything we do in the hospital, so when we go to the OR, we take a moment of silence and we just read this appreciation. And it's we're reminded every day that donation is a rare and remarkable process. The generosity of the person at the center of this process, the donor, touches everyone who takes part from family members to medical professionals to transplant recipients. So the appreciation revolves around the donor patient who is giving that gift of life. Now here's a local, I'll try and keep it together, <laughs> whenever we talk about families. Micah Story, 33-year-old male, a local Fairbanks resident, um, found down by a family member, um, rushed to Fairbanks Memorial Hospital. Escalation of care transpired. Patient was then transported immediately down to Providence. Um, Mike, Micah's health did digress, and he did uh, ultimately die of aneurysm, cerebral vascular accident. Now, I just want to read, because I can't do justice for Micah and his family. So I'm just going to read this one statement that I felt kind of encompasses what the families are dealing with with organ donation. Because we have to remember, somebody is losing a life in order to give the life to others. So. It's a profound and humbling experience to stand with families in the moment of their greatest grief and their greatest generosity. We see the very best in humanity. We see strength, courage, and hope, all in the face of their loss. So this is Micah's story. He gave the gift of life. He moved on to be an organ donor, cornea donor, and tissue donor. So this is why I do what I do because we have the honor of working with the with not only the families but the hospital staff as well. So before I cry, I'm going to move on. <laughs> and I just wanted to say um, Micah was a registered donor and we will talk a little bit about that. But in addition, his mother brought up donation to our staff. So in, in the middle of this tragic situation, the, the, the rational decision to ask about organ donation to me is mind-boggling. So hats off to Michelle for just being that compassionate, rational human being in this traumatic event. So, thank you. So, a little bit lighter <laughs> subject. Who are we? So, Life Center Northwest, as Tiffany had mentioned, it's a nonprofit organization. We are federally designated by Health and Human Services. 
So there's 58 OPOs, and we all have a region, and I'll go over that. Um, the ultimate goal for the organ procurement organization is recovery of those organs for transplantation to save lives. If a uh, transplant of an organ has been, say, it's just not healthy enough to be transplanted, the next option is research. So for example, black lung disease. We don't know really, we need to study the disease process. So research is an important element of organ procurement. So if transplant is not an option, research is a viable option. Life Center acts as a resource to support uh, the donor family, the members uh, of their family, and of course the hospital staff. And that's primarily my role, is that I work with the hospital staff. We have family services who work with the family members, and we have our organ recovery coordinators, our nurses, working closely with the family. I do more of the support for the hospital staff um, because they're dealing with death and dying. They've got compassion, fatigue, burnout. Um, so we have to really take that in consideration as well because they deal with death and dying every day someone is dying in their facility. Um, provide information so that individuals can make that informed decision about donation because sometimes people don't really know a lot about donation. Can you have an open casket funeral? Yes, you can. Um, so we provide that. We, we provide the education in the hospital and to the, the community and public. So here's our service area. I tried making Alaska as big as I could. Um, and just to put it in perspective, it's not down there with Hawaii, which is usually depicted on a map. But anyway, you can see this is our service area. So we're that, that federally designated OPO. Here, I'll put it in perspective. Uh, Florida has four of us in one state. There's one of us that covers four states. So it's just a little different um, dynamics that we deal with. We have to deal with logistics. We have Lear jets flying back and forth from here to Seattle whenever we have a, a, a case. So we have time, uh, timing issues. So we can't go on without talking about what are the laws and the regulations? Why are we here? How can we do what we do? And these are put in place for a reason. Um, 1968 started with the UAGA, Uniform Anatomical Gift Act. And that, all that said was people can donate their organs and tissue if they want to. Then 1972, uh, here comes the donor card. I don't know if you signed up in 1972 and you were given a donor card. Not yet a registry, but you had a card anyone who's 18 years or older. Then 1984, um, there's a little history here. It was um, I did some research on this law. Um, this was 84, Al Gore and Utah Senator, 84, Orrin Hatch. Okay, so they, they were wise and caught on to a business adventure that a rogue doctor was going to get involved in and start a business about organ donation and tissue. So then they swiftly enacted this law. So National Organ Transplant Act bans the purchase. So you can't buy and sell, right? It's the altruistic uh, donation. That's what, that's what makes it right. Um, it would go horribly wrong if there was a dollar um, involved in what we do. So NOTA uh, has uh, banned the purchase of sale of organs. Then we all know COBRA, we've heard about COBRA, but we all know that in uh, primarily addressing health coverage, you know, where you leave a job, you get to take that health insurance to another job. Well, it also said, okay, hospitals, you need to start working better with OPOs because we've got this deficit of uh, organs and we have a shortage of organs and people are dying waiting for transplants and so they said okay you need to start establishing a relationship with the hospitals and also be that middleman for the transplant centers and there's a reason why everything is black and white there are clear distinct lines so that there's no conflict of interest so there's a reason why everything is separated and then comes along uh, Medicare which if you've ever worked in a hospital, you've had to deal with Medicare, Medicaid. So CMS comes along, 1998, 
and they start thinking about how we can close this gap because the waiting list just keeps growing and growing and growing and the organ donors is pretty much staying flat and in fact as Americans started wearing more seat belts organ donation went down now we're seeing a little spike because we have our love of drugs in the United States and we are seeing a lot of overdoses um, but that being said, CMS says, okay, there's a few things that the hospitals have to do. You have to notify the OPO of every death in your facility. We have to capture every death, and there's a reason why. I'll tell you that in a second. So every death has to be called in. Only the trained staff by the OPO will be discussing organ donation with the family members. So we are broaching on that subject of conflict of interest. If you've got the hospital staff caring for your loved one and also asking them about organ donation. So again, we separate the powers here. Hospital staff have written agreement to work with the OPO, the tissue bank, the eye bank, that kind of thing. OPO assesses. So really, we're the ones who are assessing the potential of who can be an organ donor and who is not. And again, that's your protective mechanism for the hospital staff because they don't know who is a registered donor. They don't know who is a potential donor. They wouldn't know um, that a hepatitis C donor could transplant into a hepatitis C recipient. So they wouldn't know that, but we work with transplant centers, and if you've got a hepatitis C on the wait list, then if we have a match, we can certainly make that happen. Um, hospital allows the OPO us uh, look at health record reviews, so we follow all the HIPAA regulations and compliance with HIPAA, but we're allowed to come in and assess uh, medical records without being a staff person of the hospital. And the reason being is because we're dealing with time sensitivity issues. So timing is of essence here. And then the donor designation. So this is that box that you check at the DMV. And I don't know how many of you have checked that box, uh, <laughs> right? Um, I've got a, a next slide. I'll show you the, the states and how the states uh, compare. So it allows each state to maintain this donor registry. So the state of Alaska has a donor registry. It is confidential. So again, the hospital staff doesn't know who's a registered donor or not because they just don't need to know that because their primary concern is to save the life of that patient that just came through their doors. So they, are, they don't know who is a registered donor or not. Only the OPO people will look that confidential information up. Now, what the donor designation does, and it's also called first person authorization, this really reduces the need for the OPO to seek consent from the family. So this is that um, last decision that a person at their deathbed can make, is to be an organ donor. So if a family member objects, it's gonna be a real tough conversation. Um, so we have our professional family services folks who have degrees in social work who are trained to deal with death and bereavement and have these delicate conversations because there's two types of conversations. Again, the hospital staff does not know who's a registered donor and who's not. So the conversation can go two ways. It's, do you, would you like your loved one to be an organ donor or do you know that your loved one is a registered organ donor? So it's two different types of conversation that our family services folks have with that family. Um, and it, it could go negative very quickly if, for example, the hospital staff set brought up donation and the parents or the, the spouse was against donation. And then our staff has to come in and say, Oh, but they're registered. So it's really delicate, which is the reason why, again, it's that quote unquote separation of power, you know, separation of responsibilities between the hospital staff and the OPO. We invite the hospital staff to definitely partake in that conversation, but we just want to lead that conversation to make sure that is, is the, the best possible experience for that family 
in that traumatic time. So that's really what we're trying to do is in this traumatic time for the family, how can we bring this conversation up? Because we are literally having this conversation with families on the worst day of their life. So again, it's very delicate. Um, transplantation is priority over research, okay? So uh, for example, you probably have heard now uh, we're doing, not we, uh, UW, is started to do hand transplants um, back east. I can tell you which hospital they've successfully done a face transplant. Yes. So in other words, if they're in the OR and they are, say, recovering the hand for transplantation, and again, this is a different authorization process because it's not life-saving, it's life-enhancing. So it's a different authorization. Back to um, transplantation is the priority. So if they're recovering the hand and the patient becomes unstable, they abort this procedure to make sure that they recover the life-saving organs. So that's the, the first priority. Um, healthcare directives. We've all heard of it, um, advanced directives. Uh, what you want at the end of your life. Do you want to withdraw support? Do you want to be a full code? That kind of thing. So what this law says, the UAGA says, okay, we can work with people who are a DNR, DNI. Um, we can have organ donation supersede that. Withdraw life support. So that's your ventilated support when folks are on a ventilator. Does anyone have any questions? I know laws and regulations are kind of boring, but... <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, no, no, that's right that's correct. Um, not restricted because that is falling under the NOTA, the uh, Organ Transplant Act, National Organ Transplant Act, um, because that will go under research and education. And so that is your loophole in that law. So you can be a living donor. Yep. And, um, and we don't do uh, living kidney donation, um, so you would have to go and set that up with your transplant center. So you would go down to Virginia Mason or UW, and you would set, set that up with them. And you can get on the list. You could do directed donation, where if you have a family member who wants to donate a kidney, you could set that up through the transplant center and bypass, obviously, the OPO. Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. If you're a registered donor, we don't need consent from family members. So we would, we would, uh, of course, the hospital will find uh, legal next of kin um, because we always would like to involve them, of course, and inform them of your registry status and see if, because it always helps for somebody in the family to do health history. That's always very beneficial. Um, now, if you're not a registered donor, um, the hospital would still seek out that legal next to kin 4,000 miles away. But lice, that's your legal document. That's a legal document, first person authorization. Yes? Um, and you have access to that as soon as you die? How, how do you guys know? Oh, uh, yeah. Um, that's a state registry. Um, Department of Motor Vehicles holds that registry, uh, that database. And then um, once that phone call comes in from the hospital, 
if it's say there's there's what they call clinical triggers so if an individual is imminent death um, that that's um, that sends the nurse or whoever the bedside uh, employee is to make that phone call and then once that phone call comes in then it's kind of starts this triage tree it, it is it's a third party but it will go to it it goes to us and then we call back the hospital and and then start asking questions of that yeah yep yep oh yeah oh yeah Oh yes, yeah. Mhm, mm mhm. Mm yep. It's confidential registry, and each state has it now. Mhm. Yes. Yes, and so if you want to be an organ donor but not a cornea donor, go to alaskaregistry.com and you can start picking and choosing like, oh, I don't want to do cornea, you know, for whatever reason. So you can delineate which ones you would like to donate. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Organ Procurement Organization. It's a federally designated organization that uh, manages the procuring or recovering of organs. Mm-hmm. Um, they escalated care and he had neuro, neuro function in Fairbanks, so that, ca that phone call came from Providence. So it was kind of, I guess you can say there was hope here, and they escalated care and, and transported him down to, to um, Providence. So the phone call did not come from Fairbanks Memorial. They were just primarily concerned about escalating that care. I would presume, and I'm not a doctor, but I would presume if they felt he was imminent at Fairbanks Memorial, they would have kept him there and made the phone call. But there was hope, and so it, he was transferred. Mm-hmm. We try very hard to keep it in the region, and there's a, and I got a couple slides that's going to explain that. Yeah, so here, um, donor registration. I'm going to speed this up because I want to get to that slide too. Um, so across the nation, 50% of the uh, U.S. population are registered. So that's pretty good. Um, and of course, your license, your registry. Um, sometimes the donor process is explained to the family. State of Washington sends out pamphlets. Montana sends out pamphlets. So every time you check the box at the DMV, you're going to get sent some information. Not yet here in uh, Alaska. So then here are the, the states that you can see. So kind of Alaska and Montana are kind of always battling it out um, with the highest percentage. Um, so Montana, 18 years or older, 89% of that state is registered, uh, followed by Alaska, 86% uh, is registered. And, you know, everyone's like, why, why? And I'm like, I don't know. People are just caring individuals and giving, giving people. And, you know, especially Alaska, you just have that mentality of helping people out. If it's 20 below zero and you see somebody walking, you see if they're okay. So it's, you know, I don't know what it is, but you can kind of see the other states, you know, Vermont, New York. I mean, those are kind of pr pretty pathetic <laughs> compared to us over here. So that just gives you an idea of where people are um, with their donor status, their donor designation. Maybe. That's what I was kind of thinking. <laughs> That's true, yeah. So they're, it's a smaller percentage, yeah. 
But here's why it's so, here's why we have all these laws in place and why we do and we, when every phone call, every death is called in. Um, because the opportunity to donate is so rare, less than 1% of all the deaths in the hospital move forward to organ donation. So they're either, um, you know, a medical rule out or they're maybe a little bit too old to transplant a heart or something like that. But generally speaking, you're not going to be an organ donor. The chances of you needing an organ are greater than you becoming an organ donor. So chances, uh, so I, I find that kind of odd and kind of wrap your... Pardon? Age is a factor, yeah, yeah, age is a factor. So if you had a, a death in the hospital of an 86-year-old and uh, a 10-year-old would need a, a liver, that's not going to happen, you know. So age is, is a factor, yes. Um, but it, it's so rare that that's why the opportunity, when we have donor families to work with, I sometimes I feel like they don't understand how really rare and remarkable of a process this is. It's very fragile, it's very sensitive, it's stressful, um, and it's sad. It, you know, so it's just the whole process of what um, Micah's family went through um, is very um, rare. So less than 1%, even eligible. So it's not about you know, the how, the why, and I'm going to throw out some numbers here just to put it in perspective. Okay, so here's our waiting list. So people who need a life-saving organ transplant, 120,000 individuals, 22 people of that number, 120, uh, 22 of those individuals die every day waiting for a liver, waiting for a heart, waiting for a lung. I even tell people add to that number because you're not even touching the people who are too sick to even be listed. So you've got a whole nother group of people who can't get to the transplant center because they don't have a support system. Um, they're too sick to be listed or they were listed, then they're too sick, they were pulled off the list. So there's a lot of variation or variables at play with why people are dying on that, on that wait list. Another person's added to the wait list every 10 minutes. And the good news, though, is that one person can save eight lives. So one healthy donor patient can pull eight people off of that wait list. And the reason why it's eight is because rarely is one person going to receive both lungs. They'll separate the lungs. And rarely is one person ever going to receive both kidneys. A left kidney will go to an individual, a right kidney will go to another individual. And then here's, a, I guess, a graph, kind of put it in perspective. So you see the wait list is just, it keeps on growing. And then you see the donors are pretty flat. And the transplant, there's a little spike because there's more living kidney donors. So you are going to have more transplants. That's why that number is, um, is a little bit elevated. So that kind of puts things into perspective. Any questions here? <laughs> yeah. What is the age group that perhaps we as Well, the age really varies with donation. It could be a toddler or it could be an 86-year-old marathon runner. So, you know, if you have a healthy individual who's run marathons and never drank an ounce of liquor or smoked a cigarette, um, you might be able to place those kidneys and pull two people off the dialysis. So it just depends. Now, we have parameters and then those parameters are extended, so more aggressive. And so it, you're dealing with the transplant centers protocol because some centers are very, very conservative 
and some centers will enhance those, um, you know, their protocol and, and be a little more aggressive with what they're going to accept. Because if you have an individual, um, there was a donor and it was out of Alaska, and at the last minute, UW declined the lungs. So that's a bad day in our world. Um, when we had them placed and then poor function, and at the last minute, they were declined. Well, you know, everyone's scratching their head. Now what? Well, we are fortunate British Columbia in Vancouver, Washington, um, has a little more aggressive protocol and had an individual who literally had hours to live, and we made the phone call, and they were accepted. And so... Um, so it was, it was good news in that we can now work even outside of the U.S., and now we can go to Canada, especially from Alaska. They're our neighbors. It seems silly to discard a marginal organ um, when we can then place it somewhere in Canada and save a life. So that's what we're doing. So sometimes our Alaskan uh, organs will go to Canada. Um, ethical considerations, um, there's always ethics involved. Are we doing, you know, what are we doing here? Who's, who's declaring death? And I guess I'll just throw out a um, scenario, um, again, with that separation. So, for example, you have a, we'll say, a 14-year-old female um, uh, dying, and the last person you want to be diagnosing that death would be the transplant surgeon right? They might hasten it a little bit, or so the theory goes with that conflict of interest. So that's what we're trying, that's what we really try to protect. So you protect the healthcare workers and the, the physicians involved in this whole process, and only, and we're not even involved in, our, our folks are not involved in the declaration of death. There's this clear black and white lines of you've got the hospital staff, they're doing the death uh, declaration. Then you've got the OPO. We step in afterwards, and then the transplant um, physicians will be on the phone with us and, and really assessing the situation. So very clear black and white lines drawn with, you know, how the process evolves. So um, just, I, I guess, an ethical concept um, with organ donation is the autonomy concept, and that all that says is adults have the right to make decisions. So if you're of sound mind, you can make an uh, you can make the decision to be an organ donor. So you at 18 years of age can check that box. So the autonomy concept. Maximize the intent of the gift. So obviously if we're going to procure um, uh, I guess organs, we're going to recover all of them, not just one kidney. We will try our hardest to maximize that gift. Um, and then who gets the transplant? This is always an issue. You know, who gets, who gets to be bumped to the top of that list? Who gets to be the receiver of that life-saving liver? Um, so allocation um, is based on equal access criteria, and uh, they are distributed on objective factors. So... Black, again, is black and white. Length of time on the wait list. Either you've been on the wait list or you haven't. <laughs> so have you been on the wait list for two years or one month? So that's taken into consideration. Age. Youngest are always going to be bumped up, okay? Um, and then the new kidney allocation. I'll talk to you about that in a second. But, um, but when we talk about age, pediatrics do get priority. However, you have to take in consideration size, blood work. And so if you have an 18-year-old organ donor and a 10-year-old recipient, it just might not work because of sizing. And, and so you have to take those in consideration. And so that, um, you talked about your, the region, that's when we would go out of the region with certain organs because keep in mind, once you recover the heart and lungs, um, they're really only outside the body for maximum of six hours. But now if you're dealing with um, kidneys and liver, okay, we can expand that and get that perfect match down in California because we're looking for the best outcomes. And so that's how you would get someone at the top of the list not getting that kidney 
because it's not a match. And so it's really all these factors are in play, but you've got a perfect match in California. So maybe it's a pediatric perfect match outside our, re uh, outside our service area. So that's how kind of that works. Yeah. The transplant centers are in Seattle. Oh, yes, I'll get to that. Yeah, on ice. Believe it or not, we're still using ice. Yep, they are typically um, taking private jets back and forth. Um, sometimes you'll have two or three. You'll have the heart team from UW. You might have the lung team from UW. Might be the same. Um, you might have another uh, surgical staff from Virginia Mason. You might have our staff. So yeah, you could have several jets. Yeah. And that's, what's make, that's what makes organ donation um, work up here. So here's what I'm talking about, the solid organs, heart, lungs, liver, kidney, pancreas, small intestine, which is rarely um, recovered and, um, and transplanted. Um, but then I'm going to go back to how rare. I just want to put this in perspective when I talked about that 1%, less than 1%. Because here's kind of what you got, what we're faced with. Population, 3 million. How many deaths per year in the United States? 2.4. Um, in hospital deaths, 950,000. Potential organ donors per year across the United States, only 15,000. That's not very many. Um, deceased organ donor, donors in 2015, 85, almost 8,600. And then Life Center Northwest, our organization, um, we had 200 donors. And so this number is kind of good, bad. It was a record. It was, you know, because we're doing things better. But 200 lives had to be lost to transplant 640 patients. So it's, it's um, you know, a delicate you know, information that we give out, you know, to, to the community because really 200 people did have to lose their lives. But good news, there were 640 transplants. In, in some of these uh, major cases, uh, heart and lungs and everything, uh, do, they, um, do they all have to ma match in blood types? Yes, or, yes, or yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, they do, um, you know, and they yeah, yeah, they, there really has to be a match. And then there's two paths of donation. Um, and this is the part that gets pretty confusing for people. So it's how we die. Either your heart stops or your brain stops. So brain death, that's your brain stopping. Circulatory death, that's your heart stopping. So there's two ways that you can die. And then this allows us to have, oh, two different types of scenarios that we deal with. Um, and the brain death is um, a scenario where you maintain the donor patient on ventilative care um, to keep the, the heart and lungs viable. And so you maintain that ventilative support until the very last second. So, and then circulatory death, CMS, just it's semantics here. It's when your heart stops, but it's assurance. And remember, we're dealing with, we have to have zero error, <laughs> zero. Um, so all circulation has to see. So your heart can stop, but you still might have a fragile, thready pulse. So it's circulatory when everything stops. So two paths of donation. Um, when we go into the hospitals, it's kind of a balancing act, um, because especially up here in Alaska, hospital staffing, we might not have respiratory therapists on staff 24 seven, but they're, you know, think about what a respiratory therapist does. They're maintaining the ventilator, the oxygen, um, family time frame. What are we dealing with, with the family? Are they done? They want to go home? Or are we waiting for other family members to fly in from Florida? So we take in consideration the family and try to accommodate their needs as well. The good news with extending the family's wishes, we can do that because Life Center is 
assuming the cost of, of that donor patient management care in the hospital. So at brain death or at authorization, then Life Center, the organ procurement organization, assumes the cost. So then when the family says, can we have one more day? Grandma's flying up from Florida. We can actually say, yes, we can give you one more day. Um, Blood tests. Okay, we've got to fly it out to two different labs in the lower 48, so it's time. So again, it goes back to the whole concept of organ donation is not swift. It's not your, you know, go in and it's a very um, structured and controlled environment. Very, very controlled. Uh, donor patient management. Uh, that's the hard part because when the patient brain stops working, now there's no communication, all function. So think about hormonal imbalance. How do, you know, what your brain is sending messages to the system. So now it's all artificially, it's medically managed. So thermoregulation, keeping the blood pressure up. So they are really, it's medically managed. The patient is medically managed at that point. OR availability, is there? Or are there 20 OR cases in, or uh, orthopedic cases in front of us? So we're typically three in the morning on a Sunday or two in the morning on a holiday. It's something like that. That's where we will have our recovery. And I will say that UW will like that because th when they are recovering, say, the heart, they've got their patient prepped and ready to go by the time they land. So that's how quick, and that, and it's called that heart can only be out of the body for about six hours, and that's called cold ischemia time. So that, that organ has arrested. It's not functioning at that moment in time. It's put on ice. So really for it to be viable, six hours is about the max, and that's why it's so important um, timing, and they've got that time frame. So their patient is ready to go. So as an Alaskan, if you're on that wait list, so we have 167 Alaskans on the wait list, three Alaskans waiting for a heart, uh, three lungs, I think 14 livers and the rest are kidneys, I believe. Um, those folks are gonna have to be in Seattle or be able to be in Seattle in four hours. So that, that poses a challenge for rural Alaskans. Because think about, they're, if they're in Wrangell, I mean, can they really get from there to Fairbanks, to Anchorage, to Seattle? It's going to take a little bit of time. So they're, they've got to really position themselves to be in Anchorage or down, to, down in Seattle. So it's, it's also not easy being a, a transplant recipient either. There, it's lifelong uh, immunosuppression drugs, too. And then, of course, placement. Um, that's our team. It's um, regulated by UNOS, United Network of Organ Sharing. Um, the transplant centers puts it into the system. And then, of course, um, you know, the, the database goes to work. If you're a donor, mm -hmm. and it is Mm -hmm. If you want to be, <laughs> that is something, do you mean like whole body donation? That's something that really you need to set that up uh, before because it's, that's, you're dealing with university systems, research hospitals. And so whole body donation has to be set up um, before um, and <clears throat> And we used to deal with Denver, uh, Alaska, used to um, be able to work with a Denver uh, facility, and I, I'm not sure of the status with that at that point. But, but even if you're not an organ donor, you might be able to be a tissue donor or a cornea donor. So donation is donation. When you say yes to donation, you know, you're giving, if you could just... Um, not just, but if you're able to give cornea only, you've given somebody the gift of sight. So think of that. It's, you know, yes, organ donation is life-saving, but think about the life enhancement that you give an individual who's never seen before. And then here's your preservation time. So the heart, again, 
We're dealing with very strict time restraints, especially up here in Alaska. Really that preservation time, or the clinical term is cold ischemic time, and that's really six hours. Um, lung, same thing, about six hours. Pancreas, a little bit longer. Um, liver can be out of the body for up to 16 hours. And kidneys, evidently they're very tough and they can be flown to, you know, <laughs> Florida, I guess, because they can, they can be viable 36 hours. And they can actually be placed on a pump as well. Um, they, our, our surgical team does that, and that increases that longevity out, out of the body too. Um, and then here's just some quick donation facts, um, kind of because people always wonder, you know, because we do have people, oh, kind of wondering what happens behind the scenes. Um, complete restructuring is always performed. Open casket funeral is possible. Um, if you're a skin donor, then you just set the parameters um, for the tissue recovery folks. Um, so when you're donating skin, you're, you, that skin is typically um, reserved for burn victims. Um, so it's definitely um, a, a very uh, fragile, um, anyway, useful donor tissue, donated tissue. Um, no charge or payment to the donor family for their donation. So I did mention that. So it's, um, you know, at once authorization, the family has authorized donation, then that's when the billing uh, is uh, changed over to Life Center Northwest, the OPO. And, um, or if they're a registered donor at the diagnosis of death, that's when we would take over the billing. Most religions view donation as the greatest gift of life. There's a few religions, um, not necessarily against donation, but have to bury the body whole. So uh, Russian Orthodox is one of those religions that um, believes in burying the body whole. Um, uh, Japanese religious, religion Shinto, uh, same, same thing. Um, and I think there's one more that is against donation, not against donation, but it's just the concept of burying the body whole. Um, and cancer patients, I guess I'll just highlight that. Um, you can be a cornea, cornea donor. So it has to do with the blood brain barrier. Yes. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. So if you don't, if you don't want to be, a, if you don't want to do that, then I would definitely go to um, the registry and 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 indicate that. Yeah. So if you um, if you want to be cremated, that can be avoided. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, as far as, <clears throat> oh, yeah, yep, the hot, yep, if you have an advanced directive, that should be on site at the hospital, um, or it's communicated to the staff. Um, yeah, those conversations, unfortunately, will happen, will happen, you know, so. And there's even been thoughts, I know, um, tissue recovery, um, agencies have, you know, kind of want to pay the funeral costs, but it's kind of seen as, then, then there goes that altruistic donation, then you're paying something, and so it's kind of seen as, oh, then it's not altruism, so the debate goes on. <laughs> and then here, oh yeah, yeah. Oh, it, it, uh, the, the success rate of um, transplant recipients. And I can't speak specifically on that. That's something that you get from the transplant centers. But I will say, um, I think there was a gentleman just in the paper, wasn't here, but uh, 20 years post-heart transplant. You know, that's rare. Um, I, I, they, they look at it post one year uh, as a success. And so, <clears throat> so that is, and I apologize, I don't have that information, but, but that is something from the, the transplant centers. And that's the reason why the transplant centers are so conservative 
i.e. UW, because they're looking at the best outcomes for their patient, because they're looking at um, just that. What are the chances of this individual having a, the best quality of life for the next 10 years? Mm-hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. The recipient covers it all. The donor uh, does not accrue any bills after the time of death. Um, it's on the recipient side. Most of it's private insurance, Medicare, Medicaid. When you're dealing with face transplants, hand transplants, you're typically doing with, dealing with our VAs. Um, so Department of Defense is picking up that tab. Uh, for hand transplants, that kind of thing. Um, but yes, the recipients um, incur that cost. Caring for the families, um, support is provided. Um, 18 months bereavement or longer for the families. Um, the interesting thing that I find with families is um, we do facilitate the communication between the donor family and the recipient. And I have a donor mom in Anchorage, and um, she was a little upset because she didn't get that letter, and she didn't get that letter, and she was waiting for that letter for so long, and she's like, I want to know who got the heart, you know, who got Mikey's heart, and the, the recipient just didn't, and I had to say, you know, the situation is one of guilt. That recipient is so, I guess, filled with guilt that it sometimes takes a year for them to write that letter to the donor family. And so I had to reassure her, it's not you, it's not, it's not them being a bad person or a selfish person. Typically, they're completely guilt-ridden and they just can't pen that letter. So... She finally got that letter and was happy, um, you know, put a smile on her face when she finally did get that letter. Um, but we do um, facilitate that communication with the donor family and the recipients. Do you have any case left in that conversation? We, you mean if your child? Yeah, it's it's really it's the the donor family dictates that. Oh. Mhm. Mm and nobody knows. Well, that's a delicate situation for our family services to handle, and so they might communicate with one of your sons, but not the other son, or communicate. Um, anonymously with you if you want the communication or they don't want the communication that can all be arranged because it's how people want to process that well you won't ever have that option and unless you're a donor if you're a donor family uh, then I guess I'm, I'm not understanding the question the donor. you're the donor yeah okay You want to be anonymous? Yeah, oh. Yeah, there just wouldn't be any communication at all. Well, you would, your family would hopefully know your wishes. Oh, anonymously sign up on the registry? I guess I'm not. Yeah, I guess that's what you would have to. You would have to. Yeah. 
but we would have the registry status at our fingertips. You, when you check the box at the DMV, is that what you're saying? There is no box at the DMV that says I want to be a nurse. Yeah. Check box for a doctor. Oh. That would have. You want it to be anonymous, right? Right. Mm -hmm. That's a tough one because family members are always involved at the time of death. Uh, which is why you need to put that in writing. But if you check. <laughs> well, not necessarily. If you're on ventilated support, you, it could be a week. So, you know, so if you had that paper, that advanced directives in the safety deposit box, and somebody could get that and bring it to the hospital, then that's what's going to be honored. My whole family has that in their hands. When I made out my will and that piece of paper, they have each a copy of that. They mm -hmm. have read it, they have read through it, they know it. Mm -hmm. That's what you should do, and also have a copy at your local hospital, because if something happens to you, chances are you'll be rushed to Fairbanks Memorial. That paperwork will follow you if you be transferred anywhere else. In actuality, you should be getting a free trip in there. We're going to get it. The hospital. Yeah, so the hospital has it on file, because the hospital's always there. The doctors move around. So it's got to be... Yeah, I would say, because think about when tragic events happen, you're coming in uh, via 911 through the emergency room. So they're going to immediately pull up your health history. Boom, there's your paperwork right there. So your doctor at your primary care, they wouldn't necessarily get that information fast enough. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Yeah. I know, but if you are a registered donor, that will supersede any of their decisions. Um, and advanced care directives, I highly suggest filling those out and making sure your family abides by them. I guess they can get a court injunction to <laughs> do something different, but you know, but advanced directives, it's your last, li you know, your living will. You know what you said? Yeah. I'm going to make sure my family abides by my decisions. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know it's it's tough and family dynamics are, it, you know, that's it's real, you know. <laughs> okay, keep moving. Okay, so anyway, the caring for the families. Um, we also up here in Alaska, we have a donor celebration um, that we have. It's down in Anchorage, and donor families, recipients. Um, are invited, they're invited to tell their story, um, and typically this, the invite will, is a little bit later, so maybe a year after um, you've lost your loved one, but um, just for sensitivity reasons, but we do have the um, donor celebration. And after all, um, donation, you know, why we do what we do um, is to give the gift of life. So, and then here is our contact information. And if you uh, go to our website, um, there's Understanding Donation. It's very user-friendly, I will say, website, and it's loaded with education materials. Um, so a lot of your questions um, that I didn't answer tonight you certainly could get from the website. It's very user-friendly and, and very useful information. How do you relate it to the thing? I uh, did a will that I was required to do for the patient's physician contact. And almost all these folks did not want to be trusted. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Yet, when there is an emergency, they call 911. Mm -hmm. Right. 
Mm -hmm. You know, I guess I guess we're getting out of the scope of my practice, but I would that's that piece of paper, that advanced directive that needs to get in the hands of the, the uh, I thought there was a decal that you put in a car. Isn't there a, a, a decal or a sticker that you put in your car that indicates that tells 911 it's a DNR? Yeah, yeah. I thought there was some kind of indicator that... Right, right. Yeah. I know. These are those ethical, sticky, gray area issues that we need to talk about. Um, but I don't have the answers. <laughs> so maybe a uh, attorney would be a good place to start. Um, but so sorry about that. I don't have the answers to that. But um, I guess the take home point is let your family members know your wishes. You know, that's what I always tell people. If you do check that box, let your family members know because it's sometimes a, a not so pleasant surprise. And it's not that, that family members are surprised at, that they're an organ donor, but they're surprised that their loved one didn't tell them because it's such a personal choice. They're offended that they, that they didn't know, you know? So it's that perception of, oh, you didn't know your loved one as well as you think you did, you know? So it comes off as a little, you know, it just, it just is because people don't like to talk about these things. We, know, we don't want to talk about this stuff, so we don't. But I strongly urge you when you, if and when you do check that box, bring that to your attention of your loved ones, and, um, or DNR, DNI, those kind of things. Fill out those advanced directives and also let your family members know. So... Yep, because the heart is still pumping. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, they don't do that. But what they will, a lot of the, the blood really needs to be taken for testing because of that matching um, that's so important for the recipients. So they do need to take blood from the donor. Right, be a, a, yeah, I guess if, if there's that... Well, we don't, and that's not in our scope of practice, but I suppose, you know, the, that would be the blood bank or, you know, I don't, I don't know how that would be set up. That, that's something that, uh, to my knowledge, does not happen. And the other question, the yeah. part of that question is on blood, they, uh, you can't donate blood if you've had it the past three weeks or piercing in the last year. Yeah, recent so stuff. Um, no, not necessarily. Definitely not organs. Um, maybe you couldn't donate your skin if you had a, a, a non-professional tattoo or something like that, or piercings that might rule out, um, you know, skin donation. There's, and I will say that, and there's two different regulating agencies too. So organ donation is regulated, um, by CMS, uh, Medicare, Medicare and Medicaid, where when you're in the tissue side of things, the, uh, the bones and cartilage and skin and cornea, that's FDA regulated. And I will say the regulations on the FDA side and the tissue processor side is constantly changing. They're constantly changing their age, their restrictions, their, and the reason why, um, and not to downplay tissue, but tissue, there is enough of it to where if you need a hip replacement or you need a knee replacement, you can get, uh, you can get a graph of that um, at a moment's notice. So really, the, I guess the game that they play is they regulate it down to, to really squeeze the guidelines. Oh yes. Yes. Yeah. 
And different generations might have different ideologies with um, with recovery and transplants. Uh, 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 under eighteen, uh, assume there's something mm -hmm. magic about it. Mm -hmm. uh, supposing uh, there's somebody who's thirteen mm -hmm. who uh, doesn't want uh, wants to make a donation, but the parents don't want him or her to. Uh, the parents. Eighteen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's your magic number. Eighteen. So any any eight or seventeen, uh, or it will be considered pediatric, and will be in the PICU, not the uh, ICU, the pediatric intensive care, and parents will make all decisions. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs>